All right, we have a few more things we can say about um, these solvable groups. So, let's say, um, assume G is um, finite and solvable. Um, let um, sigma 1 be a Jordan Holder series and sigma 2 a an abelian composition series and we can we know that there's a Jordan Holder series because it's finite and we know there's an abelian composition series i.e. in a a composition series in which all of the graded pieces are abelian because we proved that that's equivalent to being solvable. Um, then we have um, equivalent refinements and we'll call these um, sigma 1 prime and sigma 2 prime. Okay, so we know that we have equivalent refinements because of the Schreier refinement theorem. So, okay, so let's look at this. So sigma 2 prime, we arrived at sigma 2 prime by taking an abelian filtration and adding in more stuff to it. Um, and because this is um, because it's a refinement of an abelian uh, composition series, the refinement is also going to be abelian. And let's see here. To see that, um, if you add in more terms in the series, uh, you know that it's possible that you'll repeat one of the subgroups that's already in there, in which case the graded piece associated with that will just be the identity. And so obviously the trivial subgroup is abelian um, cause it's for, because it's like so stupidly small that it has to be abelian. And then let's see here. If, it, if you have like um, GI gi plus 1, and this becomes like gi uh, prime, gi plus 1 prime, and then gi plus 2 prime, where like what you're doing here is when you take the, uh, you take uh, gi plus 1 contained in gi in sigma 2, and then when you refine this, you add this additional uh, group here in the middle then I'm pretty sure we can just sort of throw an isomorphism theorem at this and prove that um, this mod this is a subgroup of this mod this. And so it's a subgroup of an abelian group and thus is abelian. Or I might, and I might be pointing that in the reverse direction. And either way, this is something that you can prove. I did not work out all the details, but if you have a refinement, of an abelian composition series, then it's you're also going to have um, an abelian composition series. Um, but because these are equivalent refinements, the we have a correspondence between the graded pieces between those two terms, or between those two composition series, and so all of the composition, all of the graded pieces of sigma one prime are abelian, and but if we look at the graded pieces of sigma 1 prime, some of them are going to be trivial because you may have repeated a, a group uh, or you may have repeated one of the subgroups that appears in sigma 1. But all of the other non-trivial graded pieces are simple because they come from sigma 1, which is a Jordan Holder series. And therefore, what that tells us is that um, all of those simple... Um, all of those simple uh, quote, all those simple graded pieces in sigma one must be abelian. 
So, um, thus, the graded um, pieces of sigma 1 are abelian and simple. And thus, okay, if you've got a simple group that's abelian, what does that tell you? And thus, uh, um, the, thus each must be um, isomorphic to, if I won't write that out, out, z mod pz for some prime p. Right, because that's the only, these are the only, fi, these are the only finite abelian simple groups. So, um, thus we have, and this is a really neat thing that you can do when you're writing up stuff. I like it when, let's see, I know Jacobson does this in his textbook, where you write, thus we have proposition. And you actually, like, you have this proposition here that you're starting, but you, like, start it in the middle of a sentence. And so it kind of flows nicely because you're, you're flowing into the, uh, the, the next thing rather than it being just like a theorem, theorem proof, theorem proof, theorem proof, in which case everything is sort of jumping and you're jumping from one result to the next result instead of sort of like flowing from one result to the next result by just the discussion that you're having um but that's all like just uh not uh, it's just stylistic stuff i guess so thus um a finite group g is solvable if and only if um it has an abelian Jordan Holder series. And so what we just discussed above is one direction. We prove that if you have a finite group that is solvable, then it does have an abelian Jordan Holder series. You just take a Jordan Holder series and you know it's abelian. Um, but for the reverse direction, let's suppose you have a finite group G that has an abelian Jordan Holder series then, okay, well, if it's an, an abelian Jordan Holder series, then all of the quotients are z mod pz, and so z, each z mod pz is simple, and you're done. Wait. Wait a minute. No, no, no. That, that doesn't make sense. Finite group is solvable. You don't need it to be simple. What we need is we need. Wait, no. Yeah, if, if you have a. Hold on. Let me let me like this. This is this is easy. Let me just remember why it's easy. Um. So we we know that a. Um, well, wait, we know a, a, a group is solvable if and only if it has an abelian, um, oh no, I, I simplified this, okay, yeah, 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 here, if and only if, it's not the, that it's an abelian Jordan Holder series, it, it has a, uh, has a Jordan Holder series whose graded pieces are cyclic of prime order. There we go. Okay, so that's what we proved. I mean, we did prove that, to, that this Jordan Holder series has a billion graded pieces, but then we combined um, abelianity with 
uh, simplicity to prove um, z mod p z city. So we uh, the final result was that each graded piece is z mod p z. So the proposition is that g uh, finite group g is solvable if and only if it has a Jordan Holder series whose graded pieces are cyclic of prime order, i.e., its graded pieces are each one is z mod p z for some prime p, and the reverse is. Um, trivial since each z mod pz is going to be simple and so what you have is you wait why why is this easy it's easy because um you it's solvable and only if you have an abelian composition series oh well okay obviously each z mod pz is abelian so you have an abelian composition series and that's all you need All right, um, yeah, let's move on. Um, we are going to start, we're going to switch gears and talk about something else. Um, we're going to find C1G to be G and C to the N plus one of G to be g comma c to the n g um, for n in the natural numbers. And of course, I've said this before, I'm an analyst, natural numbers um, don't include zero. Um, I had an analysis professor once who would say, um, he, he, he joked a few times throughout the semester and his, his saying was, um, so I include, I do not include zero in the natural numbers. If you include the zero in the natural numbers, then please drop the course. I thought that was fantastic. Um, but anyways, so uh, it's, it's a little weird because here C starts at one. And when we talked about uh, uh, D, um, where we had D of G being um, G comma G, then we started at zero, but whatever. So this is this. Remember, if this is normal and this is normal, then this whole thing is normal. Um, that was one of, one of the things that we proved. If you have A normal in G and B normal in G, then you take the, the this thingy of A and B. Is, it, is there a word for that? I, I, I'm not completely sure. There probably is. I don't know what the word is. I'll just call it this thingy. But anyways, you take this thingy and then you get a normal subgroup. And so if you want to prove that um, these are all normal, then you could just simply induct. Because obviously when you start at, um, well, yeah, you could start at 1, G equals G, but you need to really sort of use the, uh, um, the, 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 two, the C2 case uh, for the induction argument, I think. And so C2 of G is just going to be um, this thingy of G and G. And of course, G is going to be normal in itself. And so that's, and in fact, that's a commutator subgroup, which we know is normal. And then by induction, uh, if you suppose that uh, all the way up to CN, these things are normal, then you look at CN plus one, you're taking the this thing of G and CN. This is normal, this is normal, therefore the whole thing is normal. So these are all normal in G. Okay, so that's the definition of these CNs. Now we define G is nilpotent. If there exists some natural number N such that C to the N of G is trivial. So let's see here. This is sort of like solvability, except we have C instead of D. And so for, for D, we had, you take the commutator of the last thing with, with itself. Here, we're taking the, the well, like not, not the commutator. For D, for, for D, you take the commutator of the thing that came before it, which is just the, this thing of the thing before it and itself. Here, we're replacing one of those with G. So we're not, um, so, each of, so each C is allowed to be a little, you're including more elements because you're including all of G in one of these entries rather than just um, the previous CN. 
Okay, so let's make some observations. We have G is C1G contains all the way down to CNG equals E um, is a composition series. Um, and obviously you can, you can, well, I guess it's not, is it obvious? Um, right. So C and the, the reason this works, CN plus one of G contained or is contained in CN of G because for all G in G, um, for all A in C and G, we have um, G A G inverse times A inverse is in C N G. And why is this true? This is true because well, A C C N G is normal in G. We prove we talked about why that's true by induction, and so. This element is in CNG, and then this is in CNG, and so this product is in CNG. But this element, these are the these elements form a generating set for CN plus one by definition, and so therefore CN plus one is contained in CN because each of the elements in the generating set is contained in CN. Um, And so there's that. Um, I think I have time for one more observation about uh, nilpotent groups before we start solving stuff or proving stuff about them. Uh, we have each uh, of these. Um, I don't know why we switched to K here, so I'm going to undo that. Um, each quotient. is abelian um, since the commutator CNG CNG is obviously going to be contained in G comma CNG which is by definition equal to C and oh, I keep messing up this I keep wanting to write K's um, Let's see here. And what I have written is that, um, okay, so the commutator of this is contained in CN plus one. And so for all A and B in CNG, we have A, B, A inverse, B inverse is in the commutator of CNG, which is contained in, oh, this is really running into the next line, but whatever. Cn plus one g, which is equal to um, here. Let me let me write this all down and then figure out what I was doing. So, a b c to the n plus one g equals b a c to the n plus one. G. Okay, cool. Yeah, right. So the commutator subgroup is uh, the commutator of uh, CN is contained in CN plus one. And so if you take any two elements in CN, uh, this element here, ABA inverse B inverse is in the commutator um, because this is part of the generating set for the commutator and that's contained in here. And so AB CN plus one is equal to BA CN plus one. And th this precisely, this is how, this is saying that commutativity in this group is a thing. Um, I meant to say that multiplication in this group is abelian. Um, but anyways, yeah, there you go. That, um, you just draw a line here to know, to block off that part, but that covers a lot of the basic facts about, um, about nilpotent groups. 
It also turns out that you can, well, I'll talk about that next time, but you can, you, you might ask what the relationship between nilpotence and solvability is, and we'll talk about that more in some of the next videos.